Hello, and welcome to What the Tech from Boast AI, where we talk with some of the brilliant minds behind new and exciting tech initiatives to learn what it takes to tackle technological uncertainty and eventually change the world. Today, I am thrilled to welcome serial ideator, brand builder, founder, and ocean advocate, Amanda Horn onto the show. Amanda is the founder of Low Less Beauty, a sustainable shave and body care company that's reimagining beauty products and personal care routines to use less water, less plastic, and less waste, creating the next wave of eco-conscious consumers. And while Amanda strives to protect both human and the planet's water resources with low less, she also plays a big role in the larger blue economy, which is booming in Eastern Canada. She's a mentor focused on the ocean science communications and brand storytelling for the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, a blue standard consultant for the Canadian node for the UN Ocean Decade Global Early Career Ocean Professionals Program, and a consultant for both the Canadian Ocean Literacy Co Coalition and Oceanic Global. And all of this is just in the past couple of years. So needless to say, Amanda knows the blue economy well, and I can't wait to pick her brain on what it takes to build a business that supports and benefits from the oceans in 2024. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Amanda. Oh, what an intro. Thanks so much for having me, Paul. I'm so excited. Oh, I'm so happy to have you here. And I know I did just list through a lot of credits <laughs> there, but I'd love to hear from you and for our audience. Tell us about your background. Tell us about Amanda and how you got into the space in the first place. I love it. One of the things I talk about a lot lately is like owning all of those different intersections and pieces and this kind of gig economy and working in this change maker space, like you have your hands on a lot of things and it's just because we're all on the same mission. So it really is about that collaborating and knowledge sharing and telling your story. So um, very small pieces and certainly there are projects that I'm more involved in than others, but it's amazing just to always connect with other ocean leaders and, and water lovers all over the world. Um, but yeah, I guess I, uh, how I got here, I've always loved water. Um, I used to market wine and now I am marketing water and ocean conservation. And it was just a, such an interesting shift. And it, it's a story that I think about a lot just because as a founder, you're, you're kind of thinking about all of these little micro moments that got you here, but I have always loved water. My most important um, and like beautiful memories with my family, with friends have always been near water. Um, we have a family cottage that is very much a legacy property. It's just like the place where we all gather together. So whether it's freshwater and canoeing or like fishing, um, or if I'm scuba diving in the ocean or free diving or dancing underwater, which is now something I've taken up, it just doesn't really matter. I I love it. And there's um just so many incredible people that I've met in the last couple of years as I've started going down this road of researching like what does it actually take to build and design a company circular and sustainable from from day one. Um, so that was really that that challenge. And I just keep meeting the most interesting voices and finding new people in the ways they describe themselves and their connections to water. So it's just something that I feel like it's the right place. And I'm just a lifelong learner in this space. And I'm very, very new. And uh, so I'm constantly learning and I love sharing what the knowledge that that I'm picking up and hope that that inspires other people um, as well. So I'm excited to tell this version of the story today. <laughs> I love that. And Amanda, I like that you rooted it all too in that you have a personal relationship with the oceans. You have a familial relationship with the oceans. And mm -hmm. I think that's something a lot of people can really relate with. I know we had met briefly before this and I discussed, I'm based here in Boston, um, very similarly my childhood was all along the ocean. It was along the Cape. It's frightening a little bit to see how much just in the past decade, things are different in all of these environments mm -hmm. that I'm used to. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'd love to go back in time and maybe take something that's a little more mission oriented in my career, but that doesn't mean that I can't pivot now. Enough about me though. But I do love though too, that you tie it back to the circular economy and just how there is a business case for actually protecting our oceans and for building new solutions that preserve the oceans, but also solve other problems too, um, that are functional solutions to people out there. So that brings me to Lowless. Could you tell me a little bit about yes. how this came together and your Genesis story in that front? Yeah, absolutely. It, um, I just gave a talk yesterday about my creative process and it's more about like I'm a serial ideator and people are always asking like you have so many ideas like isn't that chaotic isn't that like crazy and it is but the strength is in deciding which ones are meant for you to action and which ones are to leave for for somebody else or to delegate or you know and so 
the thing that I love is that creativity, I started to think about it when I was asked to give this talk. It's not about being an artist. Like creativity can be anything that is innovation in itself. It's just a different way of thinking. It's a tool. It's a skill that you can develop. And then when you bring like a structured process to it, you can decide if it's the right time to bring an idea to fruition. If you have the capacity, the energy, the motivation, the resources, the capital, like you have to have on the like, just what is the market doing? Is it the right time? And I've always known that I've wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, but I guess where this starts is it was years ago, back in 2017, I was, um, it was National Sauvignon Blanc Day. Ooh. And we had an event uh, going on in a rooftop pool um, in Toronto. And it was raining. And it sucked because it was supposed to be an, a chef influencer dinner all about pairing this New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and we had actually had a massive iceberg. So the logo for the brand that we were working with um, had an iceberg on the bottle. So we recreated a 3D model of that and wanted to float it in the pool. It was supposed to be an outdoor event. Um, but unfortunately, it was raining. So the whole event had to move inside. But I was working with this incredible event planner on it. And the two of us had been like working all day, getting everything set up. And then we both went to change. And she said to me, she's like, oh, my gosh, I forgot to shave. And like, we have this dress. And I was like, ah, me too. Like, <laughs> it's OK. And so I was thought about like, like, it would be so convenient to be able to just shave like on the go when you don't have water. Like it was a week long of I was traveling like Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, Calgary, like and you're constantly on the go, I'm always traveling for work and traveling with a personal care routine is extremely cumbersome, especially if you want to be a carry on traveler and have something that is low impact on the environment. But I wasn't even thinking about it from that conscious level. It was more just about I need something convenient because this is a problem that I run into often. And so then the last couple of years as I was working in wine and just really burnt out um, during the pandemic. And it just felt like I can't keep selling alcohol right now while the world <laughs> is on fire. And it was really challenging because there's already so many restrictions about marketing wine in Canada. Like we are a monopoly driven country, so you're already limited. Plus now responsibly marketing how to consume alcohol when there's a lot of mental health issues, financial crises going on. And you really want to make sure that you can't be promoting gathering and sharing a bottle because you're supposed to be in isolation. So we were so limited in what we did, but yet still it was like drive more sales, keep the yeah. supply chain going. There were so many elements that were really making me just question a lot of things morally. Very grateful though, that I got to keep my job throughout the pandemic. So I shouldn't complain too much, but it did set me on this idea of like, I have, I think I still love marketing. Like you really push, like a lot of people really like questioned a lot about their lives, what was going on during those couple of years. And for me, I was just feeling extremely disconnected from my work. I wasn't feeling my regular sense of creativity. And I just felt like I really need to change, like just so much anxiety and burnout and all of these things. I wasn't really taking care of myself. And so I started cold plunging, try something new with uh, some friends in my building. And we started meeting um, a breathwork and like Wim, um, yeah, Wim Hof um, breathwork and cold exposure coach. And it was like an outdoor, we would do lake dips on Sundays. And it was terrible at first because I love water, but I hate cold water. I'm always cold. And when I first started scuba diving, I would wear like a seven millimeter wetsuit in Mexico, which is just ridiculous. <laughs> so um, I never thought it would be something that I would love that would bring me a lot of peace and like that sense of connection, not only to myself, but my creativity started going back. I started to feel a lot calmer and because we had so much downtime and I was really conscious about closing my laptop at the end of the day and like starting to, I, this is how I became a podcast listener because I wasn't before. I wasn't into audiobooks, I wasn't into podcasts and all of this, but I just started researching like water is medicine. Like, what is this? Like, is it truly because I'm spending time in water that this feels really great? And because everything that I was learning as I was learning about breath work and the physiological changes that happen within our bodies, when you're breathing, when you're holding your breath, to me, I was like, oh, like one, I can't wait to scuba dive and get back in the water. But the next extension of this, all this breath holding and going deep just seems like it's free diving. And I had never um, really known about that sport or that activity or way to connect. So I bought three books. I bought Oceans for Dummies just because all I could think about was I want to scuba dive. And maybe my only way as a marketer to be relevant in this ocean conservation world is to be a scientist. And I'm not going back to school for that. I've always been arts and languages and creativity over maths and science. 
Um, but marketing is a science. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But it was really neat that I found this like um, in the title. It was written by the Cousteaus. It was, guess it was their COVID project. Um, it had something, something and the human ocean connection. So I Googled that lens and then book came up called Blue Mind, which is by Dr. Wallace J. Nichols, which is all about the science that uh, water makes you healthier, happier, like better at what you do. And I was like, I've experienced these benefits. How come nobody's talking about this? This has absolutely changed my life. And so then I was just obsessed with water and obsessed with all of the different physiological changes that happen, the deeper that we go. And the third book I bought was on free diving um, called Deep by James Nestor. So the first book he wrote was on breath. And I read that one first and then into deep. And so it was those three things that were really that catalyst for like, you love water, move out of wine, maybe go work for a CPG water brand. But then I was thinking, okay, all this greenwashing and marketers are in hot water in this whole like clean, what does that term even mean? Um, marketing conversation and sustainability is just this like, so hot right now it's this buzzword but it's really like we have to move away from using that generic term sustainability which is why what I do talk about Lolis it's circular and so um I guess to bring that full circle to how Lolis came to be is water is changing my life water is wellness in itself um now is this ocean health I'm talking about is this human health is it fresh water is it clean personal care and sanitation how do I teach people that no matter where in the world you are, your everyday actions are going to impact the ocean. Because from a marketing standpoint, I love brand building. I love being able to be that voice, that advocate, that ambassador for the brand that just embodies everything that it is. And I started looking at the way that conservation has been doing marketing and what nonprofits were doing. And I felt like there was so much a bigger mission. Like I never meant to start a beauty company. I really just wanted to start a conversation around ocean conservation. And so it's about bringing something you don't see every day into your everyday conversation so that you feel more connected to it. You start to reflect on your personal connections. How many times a day do you use water? It's something that we're not even conscious of because living here in the global North, like, yes, we have, um, I think it's 70% of the world's renewable fresh water, which is most of it. And yet the rest of the world, there are so many parts where water scarcity is such an issue. And I started to think this shaved gel idea was coming back to me. And I was just like, maybe you can now connect it back to how inconvenient it is to not have water when you want or need it and use that to start a conversation around wastewater, personal care, reducing plastic, all of these kinds of things. As a diver, like I hate seeing more plastic than fish in, in the ocean. And so I didn't want to just jump in and work for another CPG company. It just felt like all of these things were pointing to like, this is the right time for you to jump in and, and start your own business. So it was a, a long approach. It took me about nine months to kind of settle up and quit my job. And I had booked um, my dive master training. So I was just an open water scuba diver at the time. I had about 60 dives under my belt in the first five years. And then I said, I just want to dive every day and spend some time with scientists and conservationists and actually learn what it takes to become a credible ocean advocate, building and designing a circular blue beauty business from day one. So that is being very conscious of your water footprint, anything that has to do with using ocean resources responsibly, um, and really letting that lead all of the decisions like from supply chain all the way to the way that we're going to choose to market and uh, who we engage with. So it's been um, quite a mastermind of a mind map and I'm very excited at the evolution, but I've learned a ton and I've met some really brilliant people along the way. I think that's one of the scariest thing as a founder is being like, I love this so much. The story feels so personal, but I know that it's a solution that a lot of people could use. And getting that product designed to the point where I'm like, I'm obsessed with this. I would dry shave to save the ocean. I would choose to shave outside of the shower. And it had to be a much better experience than just a traditional grab your Venus razor, your single use disposable, whatever it is that you're using, your shave cream that is probably full of toxins that are not great for your skin or our water systems and come try this. And so that's been that quest, that journey um, and I'm just so grateful to have met the people along the way who are helping me build that vision and design the product. So, yeah.
<laughs> Amanda, that is a really inspiring journey because I think we could all in one way or another feel that stagnation of creativity, I think, at the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I won't, again, speak from personal experience necessarily, but mm -hmm. oh my God, does it really stink when you're going into marketing and you're there because you are a creative. And like you had said, it is a tool. Creativity is a skill. And you feel it languishing. There is nothing worse than feeling like you're languishing at your day job. And I think mm -hmm. that put on steroids at the top of the pandemic. And I think as a marketer, I just related so much with everything that you were saying there. And we have so much time to reflect when we're also, again, sitting at home doing all of this. I mean, again, I used to be in B2C. I'm in B2B now today here at mm -hmm. Boat. Um, very similarly, I, I, I think that we all... A, want to be able to be creative, but also do something that we're really proud of at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of bravery to make that transition. Um, also, shout out to all the wine uh, marketers out there in the world. I have some in my network. Stephanie Deegan, if you're out there, I know she's in France right now, but when you were listing some of those struggles, I'm like, oh yeah, it's rained literally on her parade when she's been having some events for the marketing of her wine brands. Absolutely. And it's just, everything is connected. So I'm now like, I'm only looking for water responsible and ocean focused brands. Like as an entrepreneur, still supporting myself as I build the business. I'm like, this makes sense. Wine yeah. and diving are connected. That's actually what I said when I, I quit my job. I'm like, people are cellaring their wines under the sea. Like this, oh God, you'll see me again. Huh. We're going to work together. Well, that is all. That is the circular economy right there. Not literally. There it is, yes. I love it. Another point I wanted to pull back to was, you were thinking about the actual value of the solution beyond just the sustainability, which I'm going to put in quotes because I think we all agree. It's about the circular economy and sustainability. It's almost like AI in terms of the buzzwordiness of it all today. Right. Just tagging yeah. it on, people think they're going to get attention from VCs or they think that it's going to be their magic bullet. I'm like, you actually really need to be thinking about the solution that you're driving home at the end of the day. Um, yeah. Not to say that the true sustainability of it all needs to take a back seat, but mm -hmm. you need to actually have a market for anything that you're developing. And you need to actually have some customers and you need to be doing those use cases, which you did yourself when you were ideating all of this and be like, oh yeah, <laughs> I could use it. So I love how when you were even saying like, carry on traveler convenience, I can so relate to that having had nightmares mm -hmm. flying up to all the conferences on the past few years up in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. I was talking to somebody earlier about how I was on a four day flight uh -huh. from Boston to Vancouver at the end of it all for one day of meetings. And because I didn't have just to carry on, I needed to bring some equipment. So I put it in my bag. I spent more time at that airport than I did anything else, but <laughs> I digress again. I think that being able to solve those solutions beyond just what our core mission is, is awesome. We had had Seek TK Bio on the show recently, Daniel Schum, who's a customer of ours. They work on making plastic that is again, truly actual repurposed plastics. I know yeah. that we could go on a long tangent about the truth behind plastics and recycling there, but their yes. solutions too. They're like, we started out, we just wanted to be pure play eco-conscious, but we were working mm -hmm. in the wrong direction. We needed to actually be sure that we were helping our customers solve problems. So having the sustainability of it all kind of comes in with all of that. It comes out in the wash, but you yeah. gotta focus on those pure use cases. Definitely. So and then I want to hear a little bit more about these brilliant people in your network, too. I know at the top of the show, we talked about the great advisory roles that you have with the many great organizations, including the UN. Yeah. Could you talk to me a little bit about how you got involved with them and what some of the benefits have been by finding these partners in your ecosystem? Yeah, absolutely. So again, it all goes back to that. OK, I'm a marketer. Am I relevant in ocean, in science? How do I get scientists and academics to understand and respect marketing? There just needs to be this um, better communication between creatives, scientists and sustainability experts coming together. To me, creativity engineers, artists, illustrators, musicians, chefs, the sustainable seafood and aquaculture combination, amazing underneath there. Anyone in innovation, business development, you're a creative, you're a problem solving, you're a great thinker. Science speaks for itself. That's where we need to start. We need the data. And right now is the UN Ocean Decade for Ocean Science and Sustainability. So it's a 10-year framework that was launched 
to um, in 2021, all the way to 2030. And the global goal is about how we need to protect 30% of the world ocean by 2030. So all these countries have come together to say, we're committed to this. What is our action plan? How are we actually going to um, take ownership over something that nobody has ownership over? And what kinds of activities are actually going to move that needle? And what actually counts as ocean projection and regenerative solutions? So really incredible that I had no idea that existed. I was in Indonesia doing my dive master training, learning about coral ecology and all of these other things. And that really made me realize that your business has been modeled after the four laws of ecology and that everything is connected. Everything must go somewhere. Nature knows best. So it's using nature to inspire the best ways of working that biomimicry, um, not overusing and abusing and taking more than than you give back. Um, and the last thing is that nothing comes for free or no such thing as a free lunch. So as I was looking and I'm sitting in that workshop, I'm like, that's exactly like what I've wanted, how I've wanted to model the decisions we make about lowless, which means waterless, by the way. Low is water in French and then low H2O, water, waterless. Sense. Whole other story <laughs> about that. So really, um, I'm in Indonesia and now I'm by the ocean and I'm so happy. And then my time there ends, I come back to Canada and I'm like, I need to go back. I need to be near the ocean, which then just felt like you're completely contradicting the reason why you started this. It was to teach people, no matter where you are, you are connected. You can find fresh water. There's ravines, there's rivers, there's lakes, there's all these other bodies of water. And so from there, I decided, okay, stay in Canada. Um, I had been offered a job um, back in Indonesia as a marketing director for a dive travel company. And I thought that as a marketer, my way into this industry is through tourism and ecotourism, maybe, and hospitality. And what does that look like? Because I've always been in hospitality. My first job was as a caterer, like setting up catering events, like when you're 14, like weddings and funerals and all of those things. And then moved into the service industry, which you learn probably the most I've ever learned in my life is through being in there. And then naturally wine kind of came out of that and moving on to the marketing side. So I was really, that job offer felt so full circle because there, they were a startup that I was following during the pandemic that was raising millions of dollars to build what I like to refer to as like the Airbnb of booking dive travel. It is so sophisticated in the way that you can filter, it's really cumbersome to actually book a dive trip, whether you're looking for an all-inclusive, you've got some divers in your group and others not, you've got kids and like other different accommodations that you would need to make, whether you want a private yacht or a live aboard, like there's all different ways. And diving is such a high value travel activity. So I was only thinking about it from that tourism lens, but then I never thought about diving as a tool for work, as a tool for research, as a tool for conservation. There is so much room to use citizens and citizen science, um, which is the project that I was on. So we were actually trained to be able to do survey dives and to be able to help scientists collect their basic data and research to inform whatever it is that they were working on. So that was a whole new world that I started to open up to. So after turning down that job, I said, just focus on your connections here in Canada. And I love mentorship, like being a mentor and finding somebody else um, to be my mentor. I'm like, I'm new to ocean. I need to figure out how to actually gain some credibility and actually understand what all these issues are. Like, yes, I have a very personal passion and connection to water, but is that even relevant? Is that all fluff? Like scientists hate fluff. Like how am I going to gain credibility in this space? And it was just like the universe was like, here's an opportunity to be a mentor. And it was at Impact 5, which is the International Marine Protected Area Congress. It's a conference that takes place once every five years. And I got an email about it through an organization called ECOP. I love all the acronyms in this case. <laughs> Early Career Ocean Professionals, which describes anybody not youth necessarily, anyone within the first 10 years of their ocean career. So if you are transitioning from another industry, you're upskilling and moving into this climate space and conversation, um, there's room for you. And so I joined that, they sent out an email calling on mentors and I was like, hoping I'm relevant coming from a marketing background, um, personal branding and brand storytelling and looking at how scientists better can position the work that they're doing to get people interested was really where I wanted to speak. And I also wanted to pick other people's brains on microplastic and on kelp and seaweed and all of these things that I was looking at using um, for my business. 
So I go to that conference and that really changed everything for me because I showed up as a founder of a beauty company, having no idea what I was doing there at a marine protected area, like science focused conference. And it was incredible because being hosted in Vancouver and it travels around the world. So I don't think it'll probably ever come back there. Um, But the big focus was on how leveraging or valuing traditional ecological knowledge and the stories that come from indigenous communities and bringing in that human and emotional connection back to water, like the ways and things that these cultures have known for so long. And so that just completely opened up a whole new world for me. And that's where I discovered this term of ocean literacy. I um, was sitting in on this dialogue series, the uh, ocean literacy dialogues, and it was a little bit of a debate between why ocean literacy needs to be separate from the term ocean conservation. And conservation is very much like the management and protection of like ocean resources, what we actually implement. And ocean literacy is like that branch of conversation that is all about increasing ocean knowledge and deepening our values and understanding how people, no matter where they are, understand value and connect with water, but also like, where does that fear and disconnection come from? So there's so much research going on behind that. So it was one of those moments where I was sitting in the audience and the question period opened up and I was like, do I talk about my story? Do I say that or whatever? And I just very quickly just said that I started off in political science when I was in my first year university, and I thought I was too creative for poli sci. And now it just feels like full circle that it's actually having the data and marketing to tell stories, to move and change policy, to get this work done feels very full circle. So that was an amazing light bulb moment. And that's when I was connected with um, Dr. Lisa or Diz Glithrow, who is the lead for the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition. So since then, Um, I'm so proud to work with this woman and the team at the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition. And so that was really the first catalyst, I guess, for the next couple of months and other connections and things that would would start to flow and just meeting other people who were just as passionate and very open to saying, like, I'm a climate advocate and I'm also in sustainable fashion. And like Mm -hmm. myself being like, I'm showing up as a diver today and I'm also a founder of a beauty company and my company is tied to ocean conservation. So it was a great mind state like shift that really needed to happen. And from there, just joining the early career ocean professionals just as a network on my own. And then an opportunity opened up to be part of the advisory board. And so that's an incredible connection. And you can't even, there is a huge social network analysis of who's all connected in oceans in Canada and globally, it would just be total mayhem because everything is connected. (laughs) So that was, um, very exciting. And so really with ocean literacy, there are 10 challenges for the ocean decade. And challenge 10 is about changing and reconnecting humanity's relationship um, with the ocean. And so a big piece of that is storytelling. It's how we communicate the science and we make it more accessible. And it's looking at things that have like events, like let's say Jaws, you know, in the way that media talks about the ocean and how do we kind of course correct and what is a really low, easy way to get people to think about their relationship to water and to want to take action for it. And so whatever your superpower is, like you can use that skill set and you work in tech and you meet with founders and business owners all the time. There's so much amazing technology happening in ocean, um, not like robotics, there's all kinds. And I'm just like, I'm making a waterless shave gel. Um, you know, how did that count? People are like, it's so innovative. And I'm like, really? Like, not really. No, but it is. But, um, yeah. <laughs> that is awesome, Amanda. And I like that you hit on the point of turning your passion into the credibility. You need to make it a career. Um, mm-hmm. That was very inspiring, again, to me personally, because we've all been looking to find a little more meaning, I think, in the day to day. And I know Mm -hmm. I personally am finding it and having these conversations with founders and inspiring folks like you, Amanda. But I think a lot of folks who actually become founders in their own right and actually take the entrepreneurial journey, for instance, again, I love hearing that you are in marketing and you started in marketing and it all comes back to storytelling because by combining that data with your marketing capabilities, you're able to move the needle on a lot of it because so much of it is actually 
convincing people. And you do that by telling the compelling narrative. So mm -hmm. I just want all marketers who are listening to this, don't feel discouraged. I know that we do a yes. lot of the time because we think, okay, well, I don't have the science background. Like you said, I have, I'll not show you my library here, but I have tried yeah. to teach myself a little expertise in some areas that I'm passionate about, but I'm like, I can't go back to school to be a scientist. I avoid, I went into journalism because I wanted to avoid math like the plague. And um, I, I've been pretty successful to date on it. But again, it's just, you can use your skills. You can use your creativity as a skill and as a tool to mm -hmm. make a difference in the areas where you are actual passionate about and to build that credibility and to be a founder. So Amanda, that is all fantastic. And again, while we were chatting too, I will make sure there are links to all these organizations that you listed out, but yeah. I just did a quick Google. So I had like the ocean decade up while we were talking to, and yeah. I'm going to go down a rabbit hole this afternoon and just explore what's going on in general. And I invite all of our listeners to as well. But Amanda, before we do wrap up, I do want to know yeah. what is on deck for, I guess I want to see the next year, but honestly, things change so fast. What's happening in the next couple months even for you? And what can we look forward to? Yeah, there's so many things and I feel like even in just the last week. Um, so yeah. being like the biggest thing that I was afraid of as a founder is like, I love this vision. I know what I need this to be, but how am I going to find the people that are going to want to come along for the journey with me? And me, I'm building a product. I need people who actually have real science and want to be truly innovative in this blue beauty space. And it's not just saying we don't package in virgin plastic, you know, and okay, progress over perfection. So um, for some people that fits their strategy, but coming out and saying that we want to be circular from day one, there are a lot of conscious decisions that need to happen from the ingredients themselves, the science behind the formulation. It has to be convenient for our consumer. It has to perform well. And then like, you can't really lead with conservation as a marketer. And I don't ever want, we should get to a point where that's just bottom line. Everything is sustainable. You know, everything is better for you and for the planet. So it's just like a nice to have, but it's so woven into everything. So the first step for me that was really hard was to find a lab that was going to be comfortable formulating without water. I, uh, in January, 2022, when I was like, okay, you're going to play around with this. I started ordering ingredients off of Amazon and like different suppliers and was like trying to mix and make things. I was like, you're a marketer, not a chemist. Like, this is not your wheelhouse. Like, huh you need a preservative. This went moldy after eight days. Like, how are you going to keep this shelf stable? So hire somebody else and just do what you're going to do. And so it took me months from January. It probably wasn't until June when I met um, Stoic Beauty, who are a fantastic mother and daughter team who have a water safe skincare company. So um, Yola Wodzinska, she is a, an MIT trained chemist who has been focusing the last 20 years of her research on water safe technology. And so those are ingredients that biodegrade well in water and don't accumulate in marine life and aquatic systems. And that was so important. So anything that is, especially in this world of like clean beauty and green washing and all of that, yeah. basically their standard is if there's any amount of debate over whether or not something is toxic or clean, like they just leave it out. So they had built this database of ingredients that are on this new like water safe standard. And they're also here in Canada, female badass. Can I say that on this podcast team? Like it's just, yeah. Yeah. So it just felt like, I can't believe I met these people and that, and it, yeah. So we have this great relationship over the last couple of years and as an indie, like independent beauty brand, it's really challenging because minimums to be able to produce not only packaging, but for the lab to have their quantities, like finding somebody that's willing to work with you in small batches, like just while you're getting started and doing basic sampling and owning all of those pieces. So it was just such a natural fit. So um, I'm actually, we're doing a little bit of a, a partnership, which felt very strategic just because we're aligned very much on our visions and what we really want to be in this blue beauty space. So I am going to be joining as their fractional CMO and they are going to be my operations partner. So we have some exciting things that we just feel very aligned on, on together. Um, so more on that next time we chat. So that is a really, really big one um, because that's everything. Without them, I have no product to sell and I just have a great pitch deck. 
<laughs> so I, it feels great. <laughs> no, you should be so proud of that too. And that is awesome. So I, I'm going to get a little bow centric on this, but I was so happy to hear you even said the strategic partnerships of it all. Working with people who have the expertise that you might not have in your back pocket is critical. Like Absolutely. you were saying, you're not a scientist. It's not a ding on your passions or your ability to get um, a little less moving, but you don't necessarily have that skill set and acquiring all that will derail your mission. So find those strategic partners in your communities to help you get there. Yeah. Let's dangle on all of that. Most people who are working on product development don't have that CFO language in their back pocket to communicate another one. that mm -hmm. unique innovation to the CRA. And we're getting yeah. there. Shred credits eventually. Yes. It, it's not something that anybody internally can do on their own. And it's a bridge of yeah. expertise that just you're going to waste your time and you're going to miss out on the funding if you're not working with people who do have that in exactly. their back. And again, boast here, we're a lot of founders, but we're also a lot of technologists. Yeah. We're shoulder mm -hmm. to shoulder and elbow to elbow with a lot of the customers we work with. And we yeah. want to make sure too that they're focused on driving innovation or their finance teams are making sure that their runways are extended it as much as possible exactly. but at the same time we want to make sure that we're getting them their money and we're doing it better than just checking a few boxes for folks which is yes. what i think a lot of uh people think the tax credit process looks like but you'll be leaving money on the table but all that to say i love that you sought out these strategic partnerships congrats mm -hmm. on the fractional cmo title i'm very mm -hmm. excited too that you have the stoic team to help you with the ops of it all so mm -hmm. this is fantastic amanda it's clearly going to be a very exciting few months. And like I had said, folks, I will have all of the links to all the awesome organizations that Amanda's a part of in our show mm -hmm. notes. But any parting words for our audience before we leave today? Maybe some sage wisdom on starting a business in 2024, which I know is a tall order, but <laughs> what, what are your thoughts for our listeners? Oh, I love that. Um, what I, that was exactly what theme of my presentation was about yesterday was about like mapping what is that vivid vision that you as a founder want to achieve how do you get that down on paper so somebody can turn that into a profitable business model whether or maybe that is your strength and you need somebody that helps you craft the vivid vision but even though we talked all about that and like media and marketing and where to position yourself what I ended it with just because it was a group of founders and I feel like I have these highs and lows like everybody does but you have to keep track of and celebrate all of your wins like throughout this whole process. And so I initially decided that I'm just having all these really great conversations and I don't have a ton of time to actually blog about it and people don't read anymore. Like I'm hesitant to call this a podcast anymore because I lack the consistency, but it's more of like an audio diary of these conversations <laughs> and stories um, of the people that I was meeting. So with every connection to water that I found, I would just say to that person, like, can I interview and that evolved, can I interview you? And that evolved into actually calling it bodies of water, which we are as humans. And so our bodies are 70% water. So is the planet. There are just so many parallels. The more that I started to actually look at that depth of the human ocean connection and how we are that connected. And it was just incredible. So I would say, yeah, like track those wins in whatever method like makes sense for you, but know that it's those little moments that you have to be able to come back to, like when you're, you know, going through the day to day roller coaster of building a business. <laughs> and I just had a call this morning and I was like really like high and happy and like prepared. And we were going to chat through this pitch competition application. And a person was just like, I'm just like really low today. Can we just take 10 minutes and just like talk about it? I'm like, that's part of it. Like that's the human element of, of building it and being there for each other, like as founders and knowing that it is, you're going to be on opposite ends of the spectrum and you just got to be able to keep, you know, powering through, but also it's okay to like admit that you're not okay and take that time. So I really am grateful for the communities of people that I'm finding in these growth moments and stages that, that honor that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I want to echo too that there will be communities for you at all of those stages, no matter where you are at in the startup journey. I know it sounds mm -hmm week to say just google it but you can find your connections out there and also it's a global ecosystem too um i know that we're talking a lot about the programs here in the global north even in just canada and north america but 
there's opportunities to get involved everywhere. I know that's a little bit to the side of what we were saying there, but I think it's worth repeating too. Yeah. And, and uh, again, I think that's wonderful feedback for our founder audience. That's exactly what we want to hear. Remember those wins. Don't lose sight of it. It can get easy to be discouraged, especially today. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of doom and gloom. If we're going to talk purely around funding and investments, that's one dark area you could go down. But in <laughs> yeah. general, think, remember those wins. Remember why you got into it. Remember that you're doing that creative mission yeah. that had you dive into the entrepreneurial pool in the first place. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah.